My name is Mark Spelter. I'm the director of our fossils and renewables with Disco Industries. And Disco really just stands for Irrigation Supply Company. And we changed the name uh, roughly around 1997. So, um, been in Michigan for 15 years in sales and manager of Salesforce. And uh, our owners asked me to, to dig in and put some teeth behind our, our power division. And uh, so I'm focusing on engineering firms and the EPCs, the Bechtels, and the, those type of guys, and, and educating them on ISCO and polyethylene pipe wherever I can, and working with our local sales guys that we have, which I'll touch on a bit. Uh, let's keep this informed. We've got questions, comments, whatever, bring them out. Let's, let's talk it, flush it out. I'm going to kind of fly around 10,000 feet, give you enough to wet your whistle on HDPE pipe if you, did, if you haven't before. And uh, you know, if you need to do a deep dive, Outside of this, I got my business card here. I'm here to help you. Okay. Background a little bit on what we're going to uh, discuss today. I'll give you a quick thing on uh, on ISCO. Uh, we'll get into a quick overview of some of the characteristics of polyethylene. We'll get into you know the joint fabrication of, of polyethylene. You've probably heard of blood fusion process, but we'll touch on that a little bit so that as pipers, you guys understand <coughs> what it takes to to in a sense certify that joint that people are making out in the field. Then we'll get into some insulation methods that we, the uh, gentleman here was talking to Ron, you were talking about open cut. There's other methods out there also we'll touch on. You may or may not use them in an industrial application, but at least you'll know about them. Then we'll get into fabrication uh, and spooling, which is a lot of things that we do now. Um, just like uh, SPED, ISCO has really grown up over the last 10 years. Um, so a quick background, ISCO has been around since 1962. Uh, we're celebrating our 50th year. Our owner, uh, Jim Kirschdorfer Sr., uh, passed away about four months ago. His sons, Jimmy and, and Mark, had uh, bought the company from him in 96. And uh, basically that, that picture there is the same picture you see on the islands. It's uh, the old Kirschdorfer hardware store, and if you look up on top near that tower area, there's actually the Kirschdorfer name on there, so the building's a little bit over 100 years old. Uh, some of you might remember there was a fire there um, about 10 years ago. So anyways, in, in 75, uh, Mr. Kirschdorfer said, you know what, um, I'm, doing, I'm doing irrigation design work and um, putting in golf course um, irrigation. And he really wanted to spe you know, specify the best product out there at the time, and it was polyethylene pipe. So he really changed the company from your typical PVC or steel into a polyethylene focused company in 1975. And you know, today what we look like, we're all over the country. Uh, we're based out of Louisville, Kentucky. I just happen to be lucky. We got one of our strongest chapters here. And, and uh, we're based out of Louisville, obviously. We got 27 stocking locations. We got 12 fabrication facilities. If you can draw it, we can build it. We have guys that are working 24-7 uh, all kinds of different designs, from spooling to manholes to vessels, you name it, and I'll show you some pictures. So that's what our fabrication is doing. When I started with the company in 96, we were a $10 million company, and this year we just went over $340 million. So it's been a, a hell of a ride, to be, to be frank. So it's been a lot of fun. Of course, it's not the reason that we got to $340, not just because of me. There's a lot of great people out there that, that really like our product and, and like to, to service our clients. Um, the fun news for us is we became an ESOP, an employee-owned company, at the beginning of December. They announced that news in early January to our 350 employees. So just became employee-owned. So Jimmy and Mark made the decision to, in a sense, a little bit cash out. They're staying in the business. We still have our management team. They're a part of it also as the board of directors, but um, they're kind of stepping back a little bit and letting us lead into the future. So pretty exciting for us. So. We've also made that transition from a polyethylene-based company into a total piping provider. Um, we get involved in ductile and, and PVC and polyethylene and valves and hydrants and all that kind of stuff. So you, you, you hear our name pretty much for HDPE pipe, but we do a lot of other things that round out a purchase order or a spec or whatever you want to do. So uh, Global-wise, um, we have two facilities in Australia. We have one in, in, uh, in Canada. Uh, Crossville, Canada, which is over near Edmonton, if you know where that is. Uh, we also have an office in Chile, uh, a, a stocking location of that. But some of the current projects we're working on, Mongolia, Chile, Australia, Rwanda, we're doing a 
pretty neat job there in uh, Rwanda. There's a, um, uh, it's called Killer Lake. It's got a, a serious methane issue. And they're using polyethylene, actually. We're putting a siphon into Killer Lake. We've already done phase one. There's going to be three phases of it. We did some fabrication for them. We're pulling that methane out, and they're obviously going to burn that for, for power. So uh, at the same time, we're keeping the people safe there. We're also getting some power out of it, too. So we do a lot of neat things all over the, uh, all over the world. We got 80 sales professionals. Um, I'm, I'm one of them. I'm one of the 80. Um, but we have guys virtually in every state that you may touch, uh, and probably every country you probably touch. Um, we have engineering, CAD staff that can draw you anything you want. Uh, we have guys that bring stuff in on a napkin and we turn it into a CAD form. It's, it's pretty common stuff that we do. Uh, we have fusion technicians. Right now we have a job. Uh, we're doing a job with uh, San Antonio Water uh, Authority. They're called SAWS. And uh, we have 15 technicians that are currently working fusing the pipe for the contractor. They decide to go that route. So we have a, a big staff of people that can do the fusion for you. We can train you. Obviously, you can do it yourself, too. It's, it's really your choice. We're active members in a lot of different societies, your FMs, your AWWA, ASTMs, all that kind of stuff, ISO, that, that, and uh, maybe at some point, uh, SPED, too. So uh, we're the first uh, company ever to have our end stamp for nuclear for HDP pipe. And I was telling Ron earlier, we were the first ones to have our FM stamp, which is pretty much old hat at this point 13 years ago. But we look on the horizon and realize that nuclear is probably going to be one of the alternatives to what we have going on with coal fired power plants. And we uh, received our end stamps two years ago. And we're actually, to date, there's been two projects, Callaway and Missouri, Catawba down in South Carolina, and we're involved in both of those projects. So we have our end stamps. So I'm just trying to explain to you some of the, the quality behind our work. It's, uh, I guess, probably the biggest proctology test you can take is the, uh, the end stamp. So um, we pass it with flying colors, so we're clean. We're good to go moving forward. And some characteristics. Um, temperature range is negative 180 to positive 140. I don't want to be around when it's negative 180. Um, but there's obviously a lot of cold conditions out there. And uh, the product actually gets stronger as it gets colder. And as it gets warmer, it becomes a little more elastic. So this is something to keep in mind as we, as we look at specifying polyethylene pipe. Burst strength is four times the operating pressure. Uh, pressure Abrasion resistance will outlast steel four to one. So where does that come into play? A lot of slurry, sludge lines, a lot of mine and gravel applications. We use a lot of polyethylene. So if you're getting you a steel line that's got six months, we're going to get you probably 24 months. Um, so if you have some abrasive issues, maybe you should look at polyethylene. And we can kind of walk you through that process. What about your backfill on it? Sand, gravel? We can do sand, we can do virgin back, backfill, but you kind of beat me to it. I'll, I'll be talking about okay. that in a little bit. Bro. Um, weather resistance, it's, it's, it's got a, a product in there called Carbon Black. That's what gives it the black color. And so polyethylene is actually a milky white resin. And we add 2% carbon black to the product. I guess with the black coloring, but it also protects it from the UV light. So we're in the plastic family, but the difference between us and a PVC would be PVC can get brittle if it sits out in the sun. And that's concerning about the tar pit and whatnot. Polyethylene oxidizes, and all you do is scratch off the oxidation, but it doesn't break it down. So it's uh, that 2% carbon black really helps us out. Non-toxic, non-tasting, we have our uh, C906, which is AWWA approved um, for, for pipe, for, for water pipe, if you will. Been around for you know a little over 50 years. I can tell you it's gonna last, you know, at this point, 100 years. We don't see any breakdown of the product whatsoever. Um, it's gonna, I'm sure, go beyond that, but you know, rough estimates at this point is 100 years. Availability is half inch to 64 inch. So we have all the tools and the fusion equipment and fittings and whatnot for you. To, to take care of any size project you have. Um, I guess when I first started in the business 16 years ago, um, basically kind of maxed out at 54 inch. And you kind of see it grow. And I really think you're gonna see that change this year at the 72, 72 inch or some guys that are playing with it. The key is you have the fusion equipment to put together. You know, so that's, that's something that, that we have to kind of look at. So uh, squeeze off capabilities, 
We can squeeze off polyethylene. You'll see it done a lot in the gas industry. They use Mustang uh, squeeze off tools. The biggest I've seen is 12 inch. Pretty crazy looking tool, but you can actually squeeze it off. And it'll actually, once you take that that uh, valve, if you will, off, it'll actually retain its ovality almost to 90 percent. So it's a it's a flexible product. It's it's not <coughs> in the sense of it's, it's rigid. You know, if I if I were to pick up a, a six inch piece of pipe, it's going to come straight up with four clips. It's not going to it's not going to move on. I'd sag just a little bit, but but not much. So we have the squeeze off capabilities, and then uh, pH wise, if you're ever dealing with that, we have a range of basically one point five to fourteen. You see where concrete and metal. So if you have a lot of issues with your pH, where I had a lot of experience with it was in the thumb of Michigan. A lot of sugar uh, manufacturers, all the sugar beets. And they're constantly fighting what that pH is going to be. And they were constantly eating holes in their steel pipe and whatnot. So we came back and retrofitted many, many plants with polyethylene over time because they were just constantly, they had, they had staffs of five and ten guys that were just tearing out steel pipe and putting more steel pipe in. And all was because of the, the swing in the pH. So we have a good range there to, to help you out. Uh, some final characteristics you know, it's tappable. There's multiple ways we'll touch on it. Mechanically, we can do it. Sidewall fusion, electro fusion. We'll again touch on that in just a little bit. Two to one pressure surge factor in the product, and then probably the two biggest selling features for us is the fact that it doesn't rust, rot, pit, or corrode. Doesn't support algae growth, um, and then the zero leak rate joints, which we'll touch on here in a second. So those are kind of the two things. But we can mechanically put it together. We don't have to do butt fusion. There's a lot of different reasons people use polyethylene, but those are kind of the two biggest selling features there. So the joining methods, we have uh, butt fusion, electrofusion, sidewall fusion, extrusion welding, and mechanical. I'm going to touch on just a couple of them. Uh, I won't get into extrusion welding, and, and I'll do a little bit on mechanical. But the butt fusion process and how that works is you take two sticks of 40 or 50 foot joints, and you drop them into the fusion machine. Once you drop them into the fusion machine, we're going to square up the ends by taking a facer blade to, to the ends of the pipe. Gets rid of the oils, the nicks, the dirt that might be on the ends of the pipe. I'm going to take a heater plate between 400 and 450 degrees Fahrenheit. Melt the ends. Once you get the melt that you're looking for, pull the heater plate out of the way, stick the two together. That's really the process, and I'll, I'll show it one more time. It's Thing moves a little quicker than uh, I can talk some about. So again, we load it in the machine, face it off. Once you face it off, you drop the heater plate in. The heater plate is between 400 and 450 degrees. We just want you somewhere in that range. Once we achieve the melt that we're looking for, there's different melts for different size pipe. Pull the heater plate out of the way, the way and you stick the two together pass around a butt fusion joint to give you an idea of what it looks like after it's done. So the um, some of the equipment that's out there, the biggest manufacturer of, of butt fusion equipment in the, in the world is McElroy out of Oklahoma and we're their number one distributor worldwide. Um, <clears throat> they have wheeled units they have units that are on tracks, as you can see here. We have some with lights, so you can work at dusk and dawn, uh, all that kind of stuff. As you can see in this 1648, there's a little platform for you to stand on to actually work the machine. So where they come up with the name of a 1648? So what it is is it comes ready to do 48-inch pipe, and then we lay inserts inside of it to build up to 16. So that's a, that's a, that's a huge jump. But to give you some kind of typical stuff you might see in a plant, we have a machine called a 1 4, it is 1 through 4 inch. We have a 2 8 machine, 4 12, 6 18, 18 24, 24 36. So again, they come ready to do the largest size, and we give you inserts to build up to whatever size you're looking for. And um, we have multiple, I think at this plant, we have eight 64 inch machines which is as big as a one-car garage. And they're pretty much used. <clears throat> There's always an order when it comes back. There's always something going on. It's, we're always scrambling with our mechanic, mechanics to get things back up and running and make sure it's right and change the oil and all that stuff and it's going back out the door. So 
that's pretty common. So, but the track stars are nice if you want to you know, drive it down through a creek, up a hill, pull in pipe, whatever you want to do. That's kind of the future. I know a lot of guys will use the track stars, and you can rent or purchase equipment from us. And people will say, I want a wheel unit or I want a track unit. We'll make sure we get them whatever they want. So you have a lot of different avenues there. These machines now, um, I wish they had some of this technology 16 years ago. It was a little harder to break down a butt fusion machine 16 years ago. Now they're, they're, they're pretty much two pins, they pop out, and you can do in ditch fusion. So you're doing your situation at the marathon, and you got two loose ends. You could actually just excavate the area and come down and drop in an in ditch fusion machine if you wanted to and do the butt fusion process. And basically, it's just the hydraulic hoses that will link up to this carriage up to here and you can control everything from up top. And just have a guy down there make sure that the, the uh, jaws are wrapped on the pipe correctly. So, um, again, up to 64 inch in ditch fusion if you wanted to. We've manufactured some of our own equipment, modified macro or manufacture our own just because we had situations where. The McElroy wouldn't work. They might have a four jaw configuration. We had to go with a two jaw, and there's all kinds of things out there. But we try to get creative and, and take care of our clients when we need to. So we can uh, we can build something if we, if we have to for a job. So we, we talk about the butt fusion pro process, and you guys are it's making its way back through there. That joint is actually 20% stronger than the pipe <coughs> itself. And a lot of people get into, you know, why is this an electric or is it, what, what's the deal? The reason is, is because there's 20% 20, 20 more polyethylene wrapped around that joint. That's it. Pretty simple. If you were to shave that bead on the outside and on the interior, it's as strong as the pipe itself. So all it is is more pipe wrapped around that area. You have a lot of guys that want to get into the physics and whatnot. It's really not that, that difficult. So, um, so let's talk about a little bit about the joint verification. So you've got a butt fusion joint. You've got a contractor or EPC, whatever it might be, that's doing this this butt fusion joint. Well, how do you how do you know he's doing the right things out there? So we have a couple of options for you. The first one is a uh, uh, macro and data log. We'll touch on it in a second. But proof of the pudding, right? Hydrostatic test it, make sure it's good. They pass it, bury the last joint, you're done, right? We can go that route. That's not a problem. That's what they do typically in the water and sewer industry. But you're going to see more and more. Industrial-wise, you guys can specify data loggers, bend back test, side bend, high speed tensile. You can do a lot of different things if you want to. You think on the project, depending on your owners, what they're looking for. They might scratch your head and say, you're my, you're my engineer and I like polyethylene from what you tell me, but I don't know enough about it. I don't know the contractor. How do I know that I'm getting a good joint? So the McElroy data logger, it basically records pressure temperature and time it takes to make a butt fusion joint. And it puts it on a graph, and we could spit out every joint if you wanted to on paper. We can download it, give it to you once a day, once a week, whatever you're looking for. But it doesn't, it's, it's not going to beep at you if you made a bad joint, but it is going to record the pressure, temperature, and time. All of our 12 fabrication facilities across the world, every joint that's made has a data logger on it, and we can track it back. That's how we pass our proctology test, or our understanding, at least part of it. So um, this is something you can, it, it just basically hangs on the machine. There's a port on the uh, butt fuse machine. It's got to be hydraulic, so it's got to be a 2.8 machine or bigger. Hydraulically, and it will measure your pressure, temperature, and time it takes to make a joint. And part of that process is there's a little wand in here, and you actually will, will actually put that wand onto the heater plate to make sure you're between 400 and 450 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's one of your, your uh, avenues if you want to, to, to verify a joint. Simple bend back tests. We've done that. I've seen it on the back of a pickup truck. I've seen a lot of different things. Had a situation in Michigan, we had a 36 inch bend back test. We couldn't do it. There was no, nobody around, so we eventually had to send it to a lab to bend back. But you're, that's destructive. When you're, you're pulling apart a joint, you're ripping apart part of the pipe, and that can take a lot of time energy on a job and, and, and create more costs. But we can do that. So you can do a, a side bend test. McElroy came up with their own side bend test. Basically you take a little bit of a cookie or a key if you will of, of 
the polyethylene, you run it through the macro machine to verify. I hope you can kind of see that, that angle there to verify that joint is a good joint. So it's another alternative for you. High speed tensile test. You can do that for you also. We have that in Huntsville, Alabama. We can also set you up with macro right out of Oklahoma. So we could uh, send out the, what we call the dog bones and, and do the quick snap test and tell you where you're at or where your, your contractor is. Again, just trying to give you some different options that are out there. Last one and kind of the newest one is non-destructive testing. Um, you know, base this is microwave, uh, ultrasonic. We're starting to see a lot of this in the nuclear side of things. Uh, we're obviously going to be wearing our belt suspenders when we're doing stuff in the nuclear business. And that's what we did in Callaway and also Katata. And again, we can do that. Yes, sir. Uh, I don't want to steal your thunder, no, but it's fine. It's, one of the surprises I had when I started looking into this is that it's counterintuitive. Squeezing the pipes together harder isn't always good to make a stronger joint. You That's want to correct. elaborate why that doesn't always counter? Yeah, so, um, and I have some fusion manuals here, but what you kind of create there is what they call a cold joint. So with polyethylene, after we face it off, we want to bring it against the heater plate, and we just want to rest it against the heater plate. And once we achieve the melt that we're looking for, we get nice flat edges that are, in a sense, juicy, if you will. They're, they're wet. And if you were to do a quick bring it together, what happens is it cups. And when it cups, it gets you a cold joint. And you, as an engineer or a contractor on the job site, you look at it and say, that's a great joint. All the meat and potatoes inside here aren't hitting. The whole wall, the whole thing inside that wall is not hitting. So that's what creates a, a, a cold joint or a cup joint. We have pictures in my, uh, my fusion manual there. So that's a great, great question or statement, I should say. So you're looking for nice flat edges. Literally when they bring the heater plate out of the way, the first thing you're gonna do is inspect, look inside there. It's supposed to be glass-like. Once you achieve that, there's a certain pressure that we put together with the, depends on the size of the pipe and the wall thickness. Yeah, and to add to your comment, it's the whole idea is that it's melted, you push it together and the melt the melted stuff joins. But if you push too hard, you squeeze away all the hot stuff and now yeah. there's only cold stuff and it's not gonna join because it's not melted. So and you're getting it roughly a quarter inch to half inch, depending on again the size of the pipe. So you push it with too much force, you kind of bury yourself right outside that that window of fusion, which is a quarter inch to a half inch. Well, will so, your NDE pick that up and show that cold joint when you do NDE on? It would show it. Yeah, it, yeah, it should show it there, and it would also show you the metal arm. It would show you the pressure was way too high. You'd see a spike. Because I'm I'm assuming this is more like shear waves, like we do for a regular steel pipe. Mm -hmm. sure waves, so. Yeah, that's kind of where it came from. <coughs> yeah. So, and again, you know, NED is another alternative for you. Again, you're adding a lot of cost, so just you got to kind of know your clients and and know what you're trying to, to do and achieve on that job site. We can help you walk through that process. So, again, real quick, data logger, bend back, side bend. We can do high speed tensile, and then of course we can do the non-destructive test UT. <coughs> again, your your choice. <coughs> So let's talk a little bit about electric fusion. So we talked about butt fusion, so now we're kind of moving on to another uh, product out there. Electric fusion is basically, I used to have all kinds of samples, but over six years of managing 15 sales guys, I've lost every one of my samples. That's the way it works. Um, but so a coupler, they make these up to 48 inch in size. And basically what a coupler is, it's, it's a piece of polyethylene. <coughs> There's wires bed inside in, inside the the OD of the pipe, and uh, or excuse me, the, I'm sorry, the ID of the pipe, and then we have electrodes that actually hook up to those wires, and all you're doing is really melting that coupler to the joint, and creating that zero leak rate you're looking for. I'll show you here to kind of a better idea. Um, so we have a generator that runs to a computer that's in a contractor friendly box. That's all it is. Waterproof. Uh, dummy proof, you can drop it, whatever, pretty much anything you want to do with it, it's going to work for you. And uh, it runs off a typical generator, power 110, and you actually wand in the barcode and it will tell you it's a 24 inch coupler and we are in Detroit and it's negative 8 degrees and it's, the burn time is going to be 600 seconds. We take that same coupler and we go down to Miami, Florida and it says it's sunny 82 degrees, 
that burn time is 420 seconds. So it's going to be smarter than anybody else in the room. It, it can it can get all those figures out those ambient temperatures and knows what the burn time has to be. So I got a kind of a, another video here to show you. So the coupler has two things inside of it. It has a what they call a, a hot zone, which is where the fusion takes place from here. And then we have cold zones on the ends and in the middle. I'll touch on that in a second. So this could be one other way to, to finish off a project. You've got two ends that don't want to move. You can't do blood fusion at that, at that point, so electric fusion might be an option for you. You send voltage through the copper coils. You can see it heating up here. Hopefully you can see the red. Once it heats up, we have a cool, not cool time we have to uh, allow for, and it depends on the size of the coupler. Since what I was talking about 24 inches, my model, 24 inch coupler typically is going to rest for about 45 minutes to 60 minutes. So whatever you did to get it in its place, you know, let it solidify that way. So why do we have two, why do we have two zones in a coupler in the electrofusion product? So the hot zone obviously creates the fusion process that binds it to the pipe. The cold zones on the outside keep the molten material from oozing out of the coupler, thus you've thinned your wall, thus you've lost your pressure rate, right? And then we have a cold zone in the middle that works as a dam so that we don't have molten material sliding into the ID of the pipe and blocking your flow. Obviously, engineers don't like that too much. So that's why we have a hot and cold zone. Okay? Any electrofusion product that I have in my book all works in that. You look at them and they're going to have a hot zone and cold zone in every one of them. And you have to have some type of pressure to put it together. In this case, the pressure is a tight fit between the coupler and the pipe. If we were doing some type of tap, we'd have actually a tapping tool, a ratchet set, whatever it might be, strapping device, pumps, that actually apply the pressure during the fusion process. Okay? So that's electrofusion. Kind of give you a, a good good picture here. This is the job I did in Detroit. Kind of interesting here because you've got a butt fusion joint right here. You've got a sidewall fusion joint that works basically the same way as butt fusion, but there's curved heater plates that stacked on top of each other so you're you're melting the fitting, you're melting the pipe, pull the two out of the way, you stick the two together. That's a large diameter sidewall which I'll touch on. And there's your electric fusion coupler. As you can see, we've got this wall right here. How could you do butt fusion? You couldn't. So it's a great way to kind of end out off a project. So my first couple of years, when we first started doing electric fusion, I'm, I'm a new, new kid in the block. I'm trying to sell polyethylene in, in Michigan and the contractor's like, hey, Mark, I need 3,000 feet of pipe. I need six, 60 couplers, and uh, that's about all I need. I'll be like, I'd love to sell that job, but that job should really be sold as 2,000 feet of pipe, rental of the butt fusion machine, and maybe two to four couplers. You kind of finish off a project that way. You don't do the whole, you can do the whole project if you wanted to. That's not cost effective way to do it. I can, I can sell you an eight inch coupler for $100. We can rent a two eight machine and machine for hundred dollars and fuse all day. So that's the way you want to go. But electric fusion is a great way to kind of finish off a project, still create that zero leak rate system that you're looking for. They're fully pressurated, pretty easy to install, FM rated, and again you're creating that zero leak rate that you're looking for. This picture here, same job site. You can see the pipe's kind of dirty here. So what we have to do is actually scrape the dirt off. We'll get rid of the oxidation on the pipe and get rid of the dirt, and then we'll slide those couplers on there. And as you can see here, we actually prefabricated this piece for them at a pretty good size drop. There's your electric fusion processor right there. <clears throat> it's about the size of two milk crates. It's not real big. Any questions so far? Yeah, what's the smallest size pipe you like to use? Half inch. Really? <coughs> They'll fire off in about 20 seconds. Not much at all. And all yeah. 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 Much of a gap between the pipe on that. On Great question. So, you have a coupler that's uh, you know I'm just going to make up the you got you got a 12 inch coupler and it's 16 inches long. We're trying to stab it in there eight inches on both sides. We're getting as close as we possibly can. That cold zone. Let's just say the cold zone in, in a in a uh, 12 inch coupler is four inches. You got to make sure that that two pieces of pipe or that pipe and that fitting 
at least get into the cold zone on the inside. If they don't, they'll have what they call a short stab. And what a short stab is, is my fingers are the, the, the wiring. And as everything starts to heat up, the wiring is going to actually heat up and fall off the coupler and hit the pipe, right? If I'm doing that and it falls and hits the pipe, it'll melt the pipe and they all become one. If I have an area that there's no pipe and a couple of these fall off and they have nothing to hit, guess what? They touch each other and they short each other out. And you get a short stab. It's the most typical failure you have in electrofusion couplers. The, the gap between them, I was more worried about the process part, creating gaps on the pipe. And on the electrofusion machine, you've got that roll on the inside. Is that pretty much typical for all butt joints or can it be taken off on the inside? We can take that, that butt fusion joint off if you want to. Now, let's talk a little bit about your C factor. So your C factor is, uh, for your Hayes and Williams, is 150 for polyethylene pipe, and that's with the butt fusion joints in that pipe. So if that C factor is not going to work for you, you can cut it out if you wanted to. Um, we have, there's, it's called B Trimmer, btrimmer.com, and we rent their equipment. And it basically comes in, they can go up to 200 feet. You're taking a pole down there, it's got fingers on it. You actually can see it or you can feel it. And you, you pop past the butt fusion joint, pull it tight, turn the handle once, cuts the beam, brings it out. Some processes, they run tapes through lines in order to clean them out. Yeah. You've got any crack, any gaps, or any protrusions in there that makes it hard to do that. Exactly. But uh, see, so it's really your choice, but we can do that for you. Good question. So we talked about butt fusion, way of joining, electrofusion, and then we're gonna talk, talk a little bit about mechanicals. So mechanical joints, there's a lot of companies out there that make them. JCM, Romac, Vitalik, Smith Polaris, all kinds of companies that you guys know, there's more than that, just that list. The key is to make sure it's been approved for polyethylene use. We talked about the, 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 the differences and the same, the sameness, if you will, in the plastic family of PVC and polyethylene. But there are some differences, so make sure it's been approved for polyethylene use. They all make products, they all have them approved, just make sure you're looking at the right page, because they all have a PVC section, and I'll have a polyethylene section, okay? Do you all make one? We don't make them, no. We're, we're, a we're the largest distributor of polyethylene in the world, largest in, in, in fabrication, and also uh, distributing polyethylene pipe. I'm not sure who asked that question. But, so as a manufacturer-wise, the only thing we're manufacturing is T's and Y's and elbows and 45. So we have a, a kind of a manufacturing license on one side and a sales license on the other. But we don't get involved in actual the metals. <coughs> so those are three different methods of joining polyethylene to polyethylene. So how do we join polyethylene to other piping systems? Anybody seen this picture before, an MJ adapter? You probably don't see it too much in your industry, but it's a lot in the water industry. Every valve in a water uh, project is going to be an MJ style. And all that basically is, is it, it, it's a male end that penetrates into the female end. It's got a little nose on it, <coughs> a little gasket. And again, here's your butt fusion joint. This could be electrofusion joint. And we could also use a mechanical fitting right there to join the pipe and the fitting together. Here's a good example where you might use it. I don't have any real snazzy pictures of flanges. We have 150 pound class flanges, 200 pound class flanges, all the stuff that you guys see every day on every one of your drawings. It basically has a polyethylene flange and we have a steel backup ring, slide the two together and before you do the fusion, I tell you that a lot of guys forget the, 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 the backup ring. It's happened. So I, I go out to the job site, you guys are like, how much let's get this on? I'm like, just to put it on before you do the fusion. Yeah, so, split backup rings. And they make split backup rings. The contractors can make split backup rings real quick, too. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so this is an MJ adapter to kind of give you an idea. Again, I'm giving you a little bit of water here. I know you guys don't get too involved in it, but I'm going to educate you on the full gamut of polyethylene. So here's where you might use an MJ adapter. And again, we do the flanges and all that kind of stuff. Um, we can go to other piping systems, there's all kinds of transitions, <clears throat> companies, again the same ones. Again, just make sure it's been approved for polyethylene going from poly to PVC or poly to steel or whatever it might be. <coughs> Mueller makes a great product, AquaGrip. 
basically what that is is a it's a mechanical sleeve that's got teeth inside of it that bites into steel, polyethylene, or PVC. And you can use a one fitting on either you know, PVC by PVC, poly by poly, poly by PVC, whatever, ductile by PVC, whatever you want. Pretty product. So how do we tap polyethylene? We can do it through mechanical means, which we just touched on a little bit. Sidewall fusion, electric fusion, and if you plan ahead, we can do inline T's. But a lot of guys that will think they're going to have some growth coming up, so they'll put in a 12 by 6 T just for future needs. So mechanically wise, <clears throat> we have multiple manufacturers, again, just to make sure it's been approved for polyethylene use. Sidewall fusion, never seen this before. <clears throat> So sidewall fusion works very similar to the butt fusion process. <clears throat> You've got to get rid of the oxidation that's on the pipe, get rid of the oxidation that's on the fitting. <coughs> Seat the fitting onto the pipe to make sure it's fitting properly. And you have a heater plate, concave and convex. Heater plate there is between 490 and 520. That's because there's more surface area that you're actually heating. And they make all kinds of things. They show this in, in, in gas, the yellow pipe that you see every day. Um, they make these fittings for anything and everything you want. Black, yellow, any color you really want for, for uh, doing sidewall fusion. So, <clears throat> We do a lot of hydrants. So you get a 12-inch line and come out, and we can put on six-inch tees all day long for you. And we'll do them quicker than they can dig the holes. So a sidewall fusion machine, the one you saw there is called a sidewander, does up to four-inch <clears throat> in size. So what are we doing six and eight-inch? Well, <clears throat> we use a sidewall fusion machine that's been broken, or excuse me, a, a two-eight fusion machine we break down, sand it on its nose, and it becomes a sidewall fusion unit. So it's called a 2-8-CU combo unit. Mark, I missed the tapping portion of that. Okay, I'll go back. Maybe it won't. <laughs> so in this fitting here, You're referring to drilling out the pipe? Right. Well, so, <clears throat> in this fitting that we're showing here, there's actually a cutter inside the, inside the fitting. <clears throat> You'll see what a cap is. Right there is a cutter. We also make, we, we, there's all kinds of different cutting mechanisms out there for these types of fittings. And then if it's a branch saddle and it's a dead line, you can obviously go in there with a hole saw and do it. We also do live main taps. We can drop a flange on there and they can hang a tapping valve off of that if they wanted to. So there's a lot of different choices that help you answer the question. They don't really show it, but you would pop this cap off and it's a hex wrench and you just wind it down, cuts the coupon. As long as you come back up above this lateral, you get a live main tap. It pulls a coupon and back out with it? Correct. A lot of people say, is that a valve? No, it's not. It's going gonna, it's gonna to shut down 95% of your flow, but it's not a valve. It's not full shut off. So kind of keep that in mind. Did I answer your question over? Okay. With sidewall fusion, what you're looking for, the butt fusion, you saw two beads, two rule backs. This is three beads, one from the pipe, one from the fitting, and the middle one is the two coming together. <clears throat> so when we go out and train people, we're looking for three beads. If you don't get three beads, you don't tap it. You move over and you redo it. You might have to burn a fitting, but you haven't tapped the pipe at that point. So that's something we will train our guys on. Hey, make sure you get three beads. You get two, you get two and a half, that, that doesn't work. Three beads. So that's something you can look for and feel. Electrofusion taps, same thing when you saw the coupler, hot and cold zones, all kinds of stuff in our catalog. 
Um, I could be here all day showing the electric unit. That, that part of the market has really grown over the last 15 years. When I first came in, the, the largest we did was 18 inch. And now they do 48 inch, give you an idea. So, pr pretty crazy. So different styles of polyethylene. So there's sewer grade, industrial water grade. We can get iron pipe size, we can get ductile iron pipe size, EWWA. So the same OD as ductile iron pipe, the same OD as iron pipe size. We have reflective IDs, so that if you want to TV the line constantly, we can give you what we call like an Oreo cookie. White interior, black shell. You shine a light on a black hole, it's still black. It's pretty tough to see, so we can do one screen, one too. Other uh, color stripes, you know, we have you know blue stripes and yellow stripes and green stripes, red stripes, orange stripes. I had a client that wanted a brown stripe. I'm not going to tell you why. They wanted a brown stripe to signify. And they were very specific on their brown. They wanted a certain brown. <laughs> Unbelievable. But one manufacturer has 27 different colors you can choose from. Your choice. <coughs> so if you're doing a chemical plant, you want to be able to Designate you got all these black lines, whatever you can put different stripes on it if you wanted to. Standard dimension ratio ratings. So we go from DR7 to DR325. Thinnest wall would be 32.5. Thicker wall would be DR7. <clears throat> Wheelhouse stuff is DR11, 160 psi rated, and DR17, which is 100 psi rated. That's what we sell the most of. How do you hydro test those lines? <coughs> How do you what? Do you hydro test those lines? Yeah, we do. Um, they'll fill them with water and air, and we'll have valves at the end. Um, typically, your blind flanges that are in the end, we don't want them to be polyethylene because polyethylene will flex. So they'll put steel flanges on the ends of the valve, on the ends of the, uh, the flanges, and tap right there. What about supporting those lines? <clears throat> um, if you got them just kind of laid out. Yeah, but you know, earth shifting and stuff like that, you know. You talk, uh, so, like, you're talking about putting in pipe supports and yeah, well, that type of stuff, and pipe stands, and yeah, it, to it, it a lot. I get that question a lot, and so when we're running numbers, typically anywhere from 10 to 15 feet, we're putting a, a pipe stand or an anchor. And that's based on pipe size. Correct. So, it's gonna, we, we can run the calculation, that number can go higher and go lower, it just depends on the application. But I can tell you that it usually falls between 10 and 15 virtually every time I've done it. Do you have a chart that says that? Uh, yeah, there's there's charts out there. A bunch of two inch, and they said the typical that minimum is five feet, and you have a chart that tells you that. Yeah, exactly. And, and we can run a calculation for you, depending on the temperature, what's going through the pipe, what the application is. Okay, which call for what the stuff above ground? <coughs> not not a ton. I mean, it's it's. I'm going to say it's probably 15% uh, of our business. The rest of it's underground. They're doing fire main loops, that type of thing. Um, I've seen it using the fire plants to swear to Yeah. Show a lot of fly ash, slurry show lines. Do power. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Just lay on the ground. Yeah. Pardon? Just lay it out of your ground. The final part of the different styles here. So. When I came to business, we were doing 3408. We kind of shifted over to 3608 resin. And now what you're going to see, and we have it in our catalog, is 4710 resin, which is basically a PE100 over in Europe. You take the PE100 resin, you drop it into our ASTM standards, it becomes a 4710 is what it's called. Now what is this 4710 that we're talking about? It's their walls at higher pressure ratings, better flow capabilities, because you have a bigger ID, better slow crack growth resistance. We meet all those ASTM standards, and we're currently in the process of getting our C901, C906 AWWA approval. I can tell you right now, everything you're seeing, fitting-wise and pipe, is already 4710 resin, and they dual stamp it with 3608. Just the way it is. And you can take 4710 and fuse it to 3608. You can take 3608 and fuse it to 3408. Same IDs? No, different IDs because it's, a, it's, it's less material is needed okay. to get the pressure rating you're looking for. OD is the same. So your ID is going to be a little different. Basically, we're, we're, we're dropping 
up a an SDR. So our you know a, a DR 13.5 now will be rated to 160 psi, whereas before it'd be in the one one uh, uh, twenty range. Yes, Bill. <coughs> I was going to comment on the pipe support. Uh, it's there's a couple of surprises in HDPE pipe. One is that. Um, it's a good surprise. It's got about a 400% yield before failure, uh, which is really good. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. The but the another surprise to it is that it has a big coefficient of expansion, and so uh, this Catawba plant that used it for uh, <coughs> water feed lines from a from one of their uh, pond heat sinks uh, had to do a lot of anchoring where it entered the the power station because the coefficient expansion was so great they had to pay a lot of attention to anchors wall penetrations and anchors so um, this other thing about the slow crack, crack slow crack growth um, I don't know if I'm correct in describing it this way but uh, HDPE pipe really never stops yielding so uh, it's just like you just it, you just calculate the race to yield so that it lasts the useful life. I'm, I'm probably not scientific enough to, to describe it correctly. Hey, you're but, above me already. <laughs> but but it, it goes on, it never stops yielding, so they found that over time these things will always yield to failure. It's just you have to make them strong enough so that they won't yield at any useful life you could ever consider. But they just go on yielding to failure. No. Yeah, if you're a, if you're going to drill a hole in polyethylene pipe, actually the hole will just be stress stress relieved around, it. It will constantly move and it won't get any bigger. It'll actually almost swallow that hole. You won't be able to see it. And it's there, but you wouldn't even be able to see it. Whereas a PVC that can crack and propagate and go end to end, that's not going to happen with polyethylene. So a good rule of thumb that's out there, it's called the 110-100 rule. Okay, who so supplies take, who supplies the pipe support? Who, who supplies it? Yeah, I mean, or is it a design suggestion? We would, we would help you, you get a suggestion in there, but obviously we're not going to stamp the, the, the final plans, but we give you all kinds of literature and whatnot to, to run How to support it. the types that you would recommend, but there's not a supplier that, like generic pipe support, whether above or below ground requirements. Uh, Everything's standard. It's you know, it's standard just like any other pipe. I mean, it's the same least, pipe support is like same straps, all the straps and all that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So there's a there's a plastic pipe institute, and I think they have a handbook. Is that correct? Yeah. That describe all kinds of support. Yeah. Recommended support. Recommended support, support, support schemes. Because I don't know whether that metal against that would happen in effect over a long time. Mm -hmm. Dude, every day, I just had a dam where we had pipe supports left and right all over it. Okay. in Birmingham, so um, so the, the rule of thumb that's out there is called 110-100. So if I take 100 feet of pipe and I fuse it, and we're sitting here in the nice summer heat of Louisville and it goes from 80 degrees to 90 degrees, it's non-restrained, it's not, it's just sitting out in this parking lot. It will swell one inch for every 10 degrees at 100 feet. And it gives you the idea. So if it goes from 80 to 70, it's going to shrink one inch. So it's called a 110 100 roll. Again, we haven't put pipe supports on it, we haven't put flanges on it, no MJ adapters, not below grade. That just kind of gives you a good rule of thumb. But it's actually, you know, every every product expands and tracks. Polyethylene does it at 200 times less than a steel when it comes to pipe force. I mean, we had a situation where you'll see a steel line could pull out a wall or whatnot if it expands enough. Polyethylene is not going to be strong enough to do that. So you just kind of keep that in your mind, the 110, 100 rule. We can help you with how much something's going to move. Uh, it can be the beast of a project, or it can be the blessing of a project, especially if you know how, if you remember my 110, 100 rule. Does it, okay. does it grow into itself and absorb itself on some expansion? It, it does. It's not, you're not going to all of a sudden see it move too much this way. It's not gonna look like a, a snake swallowing something or whatever. It's just gonna, it's gonna, yeah. So just this kind of a good rule of thumb. Again, once you bury it, if you were to bury it, we don't see these kind of issues. But just just kind of keep that in mind. So some of the markets, nuclear wise, 
any of the power markets that you see out there, we're doing fire main loops, raw water intakes, outfalls, slurry lines, those type of things. Um, same thing on industrial wise, same, same things you see. Um, I was talking to one gentleman beforehand, a Motiva project, I was talking to Lee about that. Motiva was the, the first refinery built in the United States in quite a long time. And we did all the, the, the FM lines on there, and there we had 10 technicians that were out there every day. Using pipe. <clears throat> so, Motiva in Port Arthur? <coughs> exactly. Yeah. A couple of our Houston guys are the ones that took care of that project. So, uh, chemical lines, all that kind of stuff. So, you name it, we can pretty much do it when it comes to power, industrial. We have large diameter above 64 inch to 120 inch. Um, so, if you're looking for like a foul odor control project, that type of thing, you start seeing this out west when they're trying to uh, capture the water runoff from mountains. You see a ton in Oregon and Utah and those kind of areas. So we have large diameter. They can, we can do electrofusion ends on this. They actually will make it into the pipe itself. We can do a bell and spigot. We can do a lot of different things. We do a lot of fabrication with 120 inch manholes for landfills and different types of vessels. The key is to understand some of the characteristics and apply it to some of the different clients that you guys have out there. That's really, you know, is it a zero leak rate? Is it corrosion resistant that you're looking for? Is it flexibility? You, you name it. We get in municipal markets where we kind of cut our teeth. Oil patch is a real big business for us. We're doing a lot of stuff in Marcella Shale, Pennsylvania, Balkans over in North Dakota, South Dakota, down in Rose area, all the all the oil fields that are down there. We're doing polyethylene pipe, uh, gas gathering and and uh, gas distribution, landfill, that kind of thing. We have a cul culvert line division. We actually have we machine male and female ends, and we can snap it together for culvert lines. And then they'll slide it into the culvert and we'll grout the annular space. It's called snap tight. Um, so, how we install polyethylene, you open cut, you open cut trenching, slip line, pipe bursting, and, and directional drilling. In open cut wise, you're, you're kind of mentioning, um, we can do that with the best one, it's not, not a big deal. And typically what we have is a safety issue. We have to get guys down the hole typically. To, to put the pipe together, poly it, and then you fuse it above grade, push it in the ground, use your virgin materials. We also use, you know, we can recommend different types of standard bedding practices that you're looking for. Virginal wise, we're just looking for rocks that are less than, than two inches. Because over time, it can wear in, uh, on the pipe. So just kind of keep that in mind. But if you want to use a virgin material, we have no issue with that. The pipe's all fused together. It's not going anywhere. We're not, we're not concerned about that whatsoever. But when you start doing, um, open cut and get sloppy. Um, and we get into slip winding is another example of what we do. This would be a trenchless technology. Basically, you fuse all the polyethylene above grade. You put a, a uh, head on the front here, pulling head, and you wedge this thing in line. And you literally will pull it in one direction. This becomes your exit and entry pit. In this case, it's an entry pit. <clears throat> and then you go the other way. You got a pulling and a pushing technique that you can do for slip line. Done quite a bit in the water and sewer market all day long. They do a lot of it on road board. Yeah, yeah you'll see that in just a second. Whoever put this together is a perfect example where you put an electrofusion coupler, they show a steel band, but uh, you know, hey, that's IT for you, right? That's a perfect example where you might use an electrofusion coupler on that joint at that point. Then a lot of slip line projects. Um, Again, your butt fusion, minimizing the excavation. You can a lot of times reduce your idea in existing pipe, but your flow rates are so good with polyethylene, you improve the flow. <clears throat> we can go right down the street if you want to. Next one is called pipe bursting. You look at your current line, you say, I have a community that's growing. This 8 inch line's not going to work for me anymore. I need to go to 12 inch. Again, it looks just like slip line. The difference is they put a pneumatic hammering head in the front of that polyethylene. As they're wedging in the 8 inch pipe, they're expanding and tracking on that, and there's blades that will cut that existing pipe, break it apart, and pull the polyethylene through. If you're doing ductile iron, there's like glass cutters, they, they, multiple, they score it multiple times and it finally falls apart. If it's cast iron, you almost look at it and it breaks apart. Uh, PVC is cut in three locations. Um, I did a, the largest project in North America at the time. Um, in 98, it was in Warren, Michigan. We do a ton of it in Houston, 
Jacksonville. There's a ton of areas that do a lot of pipe bursting. So if you have a situation where you're, when I need to upsize this line, what am I going to do? You have your choice. You can open cut and pull it out if you don't have any space, or you can do pipe bursting. So it's a pretty neat, you know, and this, this is kind of what they look like. Just all kinds of different tools that you put on the front. Um, they'll, they'll actually spill betonite out of the snaws area here. It actually lubricates the hole as you're bringing it, bringing it through. But it's pretty neat to see. It is 12 inch, and I did 12 inch to, to 14 inch. And I saw a job where it went from 14 inch to 24 inch. So kind of crazy stuff that's out there. So, but again, you have two choices, and you have to upsize the line. You have to pull it out. Excavate and pull it out, or you can do pipe bursting. So you might as well sometimes look at that option. If you have a plant with a lot of things in its way, you might be able to do some pipe bursting. So I kind of keep that in mind. That's what it looks like before it's been pulled in. Yes? What's the cost comparison? Well, you, you, where you save all your money is in restoration. That's where they see, you know, restoration can be a big part of a project, depending on what we're talking about. But that's, that's where you save roughly 85% of your restoration. What do you mean restoration? Well, if you're doing a water sewer project, um, you're digging up Miss Smith's Magnolia bushes and Mr. Jones. Oh, okay. Well, if you're doing anything else, you're, you're doing asphalt and concrete and yeah. back, back filling on it and everything else. And the, and the compaction of the soil around there is enough to make room for the burst pipe? Yeah. Okay. And they have all kinds of different scales out there depending on what kind of soil conditions you are. Yeah. Probably the best company that's out there is a company called TT Technologies. It does this type of yeah. What they rent the equipment and they sell it to contractors, and we work hand in hand with them to, to help them through the project. What do you do about all the taps into the line, though? You have to excavate those areas. So you know, my example was we we did a job where it was uh, called Shady Lane in Michigan, and every house was roughly every 50 feet. So you start excavating all those water main taps, you've almost got yourself an open cut project, right? Yeah. The difference is they had oak trees that I couldn't get my hands around. Mm -hmm. It was called Shady Lane for a reason. That's where the community wanted to go, and that's the way they did it. And we, we saved every tree but one on a street of 30 houses. So <clears throat> there's some benefit to it. You rip out those trees, those houses aren't worth $100,000. But with those trees and the shade and what it creates, those houses were worth a lot more than that. So. Directional drilling, I think you, you kind of mentioned that a little bit. Make sure you have a duckbill head on the front of a steel rod system. These rods are every 20 feet, they're pushing more and more rods. The way this duckbill head works, it's kind of working with the resistance of the ground. It's Friday afternoon, middle of summer, Louisville, you just got paid, you got your paycheck in your pocket, and you roll the window down, and you start doing one of these with your hand. It's working the same way. My hand's working with the resistance of the wind. In this case, they work with resistance to the ground. So they can move that thing up and down, different pitches, whatever you want. If you use the polyethylene above grade, pull it back through the hole. <clears throat> you push those drill rods through, you pop out the other side, take a reamer, that's one and a half times the size of the pipe, and you pull it back through that hole, and you ring that hole one, two times, and you come back out, grab a hold of the polyethylene, and pull it back through. In this application, obviously, you see it underneath the lake, to be underneath the road, whatever you might have. You might have an industrial application where you might need to use this. What um, happens when you run into a lot of rock, Paul Mason? Yeah. Get a lot of, you can get some rock, there's no doubt, and this thing can back up and move around it if it needs to. There's a sond inside that ductile head that is giving information to the guy that's working this. And there's also, in this case, there would be a guy in a boat tracking this and giving pitch, depth, and, and roll information back to the main guy that can change that up quite a bit. So it's pretty slick. Um, when I first started out, 12 inch was about what they do. My last time in day-to-day -day sales in Michigan, we did a 36 inch job, 3,000 feet in Holland, Michigan. Go ahead and look it up. And I guarantee that's not even the biggest today at this point. But the, the reamer was as big as a Volkswagen Beetle, about the size of the reamer. How big a pipe was? 36 inch. Okay. I pulled a 14 inch under the Mississippi. Yeah. Okay. About seven miles. Okay. And that's that's kind of that's real common now. And that used to be way up there. Now 14 inch. Oh, y'all heard Every day, right? So, just another avenue for you. 
This job is kind of cool, Lake Erie, we fuse a polyethylene marina. We were doing a direction drill and a, and a uh, intake, and we actually just popped out of the lake. You see the reamer on here, a swivel, put them in the polyethylene, pull the polyethylene back to that hole. We guess in the middle of winter time, there's some fishermen out there, and they thought that was a Loch Ness monster coming out. <laughs> so, job done by what they call Gleason Construction out of Toledo, Ohio. We're finished up here. We're almost done, guys. Hang with me here. So fabrication-wise, we can do all kinds of stuff from 2 inch to 120 inch. We do elbows, T's, Y's, all different types of structures here. Again, if you can draw it, we can build it. The question is, can you, a lot of guys will call me up and say, I got this thing that you're going to call it, and I don't know. Can you get that for me? I'm like, I need you to draw me something. Tell me what you're looking for. This just kind of shows you the, uh, the heater place and the cutting tools that we have. Right here at Riverport, you guys ever want to come down and see the fabrication? More than happy to drive you down there and show you around. Every day is a, an adventure. There's something else going on. It could be a job from a Wanda to a basic T to a manhole to a vessel. Whatever you're looking for, I'm, I'm here to show you. And we can, if you're looking for something specific, we'll, we'll kind of wait and see when it comes in. And then we'll, we'll bring you down to Riverport, which is, I don't know, half hour from here at the most. And you all know where that is. So uh, we get involved in spools and manifolds and all these different types of things. I want to touch a little bit on spooling. <clears throat> this is how we did the Motiva job. We looked at the job, looked at the CAD drawings, and we literally would break down the job into flange sections for them. And we fabricated them all off site where it was clean, we had a data logger, and it wasn't wet. We shipped it all to the job site and basically erected the, the system right there. We saved them a lot of money doing that. So and we have a high, obviously a high quality fabrication that we can do for you. So, if you have a job out there, we can actually take it off and do spool pieces for you, one through whatever. We'll bring it out to the job site that way. How, how, how uh, who's accepting HDPE? Is it the water guys? Well, that's where it started. In, you know, it started in the gas industry. No, but I mean um, in the in the process guys like Multiva. Is it the water guys, the fire water guys? They said, hey, yeah, this is the where way we go. really get our, our where we make our inroads. Bill is the FM piping. That's kind of where it starts. And then people say, hey, this is pretty, pretty slick stuff. Let's try it over here. Okay. We usually get the hardest part of a project. And they're not sure what else to do. They're kind of scratching their head and we kind of move from there. But FM is, is becoming wheelhouse stuff for us. We do it every day. And you know, we do it in multiple plants. Our FM lines are always going. So I've used it a lot in the past with uh, I guess it's companies that have neutralization tanks. Your pHs are very in there. Yeah. Uh, a lot of this pipe is above ground. You have to be more careful with the support, but it works real well for, like you said at the very beginning, varying pHs that you're going to run through. Yeah. So you got corrosion mm -hmm. issues, and might be something to look at. I'm not going to say polyethylene for every job. <clears throat> it's got a temperature range, pH range, but it's going to fit 95% of those jobs out there and do it very well. And I've used it uh, double walled sumps and ground. Mm -hmm. Or you've got to protect against. Uh, so your double wall is right there. Yeah. Your dual containment. You know, we do. Uh, we're doing some tritium work right now at a nuclear plant, uh, Braywood, out of outside of Chicago. <clears throat> Leachate, hazardous waste, that type of stuff. So we can do your dual containment systems for you. Um, so you know, manholes, knockout manholes. There's a huge vessel. It's 120 inch right there. So a lot of different things we can do for you. <clears throat> Spool piece we did in, in Detroit for me. You can see your 150 pound class flanges here. That was for a uh, water job. They were put in a brand new uh, building and they used polyethylene all the way around the building to uh, convey all the water. There's your dual containment. Again, you got a nasty environment, you need to put any kind of ports, that type of stuff, leak detection, we can help you out with that. Bill kind of mentioned this. Plasticpipe.org, great place to get a lot of good information there. Uh, PEPipe.org has some good information. Of course, our website has all these animations and different things that are out there if you want to show somebody something we talked about today. You had a question? Oh, yeah. You want to do um, <clears throat> I've even seen, of course, I don't see you doing it, but I've even seen guys making pressure vessels <coughs> now out of polyethylene by wrapping polyethylene and fusing it as they wrap it. So the Houston Houston tank is doing stuff like that. Okay. So it's a, it's an up and coming technology. So it's uh, I mean it might be new to you guys. It's been around for quite a long time, and we've been doing it for 
we're, we're a pretty lucky company to, to kind of sink our teeth into a pretty neat product and it's really kind of carried us quite a long way. So we can usually put a tool in your tool belt for you. So I have some catalogs. I can mail you catalogs. I've got business cards. Anybody wants anything? I didn't want to flood you with a bunch of information if you want to pass those around or whatever. Uh, I'm here to help. Um, I can get you in contact with a local guy. Or I, I can give it to a local guy. I can take it on myself. Whatever you want to do. You got a, got a job in Louisiana. I'm in Timbuktu. I'll have a guy in Louisiana to you in a couple of days. Not not a big deal. So you got eight professionals across the country. All been trained up, ready to go, and trying to help you out. So I appreciate your time. I know it's getting kind of late. So. Yeah. Thank you.